Hi everybody. So for those of you um, watching this um, recorded, you are in for a treat. I don't know if you realize it or not yet. Um, probably you've got some kind of idea because I've been messaging you about this. <laughs> so today we are joined with um, a very special guest, Jake, um, and I'm going to let him introduce himself in a minute. Um, but I feel very blessed um, with what I do to be working with um, some really amazing people out there and Jake is one of those people. So he specializes in um, what's called the mind-body connection, and I'm going to let him explain that, as I say, in a minute. Um, but through the mind-body connection, we're really able to understand our bodies um, at a deeper level. And what I love about it the most is that it's all about realizing that our bodies aren't broken. I feel like a lot of us go through this life thinking that our bodies are against us. Um, and if you have, you know, been in any of my content you'll know that I'm very big on um, even saying that our inner mean girl she's doing us a, a, a job at some level so it's very similar with um, any of the physical symptoms that we experience in our bodies so Jake's going to talk about that in the context of pain in particular but we're also going to kind of dive into um, other aspects as well um, in this discussion so Without further ado, I'll let Jake introduce himself. So Jake, thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate having you. I'm stoked to be here. Thanks, Lizzie. Yeah. So whereabouts are you coming from? And you know, how did you get into knowing about the mind-body connection? Yeah, beautiful. So um, if you can't tell, I'm from Australia. Um, how you going? And uh, I live in a beautiful part of the world called the Sunshine Coast. So subtropical lovely surf lovely beaches so um yeah basically my journey with the mind body connection started um traditionally I was, i'm trained as a chiropractor uh, and i practiced for a number of years and one of the things that i realized is so many people's physical ailments weren't physical and the reason i came to this realization was was twofold firstly i'd have certain patients lizzie that i would adjust and do everything right and they just wouldn't get better no matter what I did. And these people were typically seeing other allied healthcare professionals. They'd seen their doctors, they'd seen naturopaths, they'd seen um, physiotherapists. And they're often coming to me with as a bit of a last resort. And then these people still weren't improving or getting better. And so what that made me realize is that it wasn't anything that I was missing as such uh, from a physical perspective. But I realized that a lot of these people were dealing with particular stressful events and um, that's what was causing their body to adapt and then secondly I was dealing with the same thing right mm. <laughs> I um I grew up um constantly injured like I would have injury after injury after injury after injury and all of these injuries were basically out of the blue like they 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 didn't have a real onset um I'd just wake up some mornings and I wouldn't be able to turn my neck or bend over and despite having all of them, like as a chiropractor, you have mates who are amazing therapists in all different walks of life. And despite having access to all these incredible therapies, I still couldn't improve myself. And it was around this time that I actually discovered uh, Germany Medicine, which is, I like to call it the roadmap of the mind-body connection. And once I started to learn about this, I started to see that the reason that I hadn't healed, the reason I was still struggling with all these injuries wasn't because of anything physical it wasn't because of i wasn't stretching enough or it wasn't because of my desk set up it wasn't because of my bed it wasn't because i was eating too much sugar it was purely because i'd been through stressful events and hadn't dealt with them and unconsciously my brain was reliving them and so once i was able to start um, processing that stuff at the level of the mind that's when my body started to heal and so from then I started implementing it with those clients that just didn't get better no matter what I did and, and bang, they started to get some incredible results. So since then I sold my, uh, sold my practice and practice entirely online, uh, focusing on uh, helping people understand that firstly, their bodies aren't broken. And secondly, helping them to understand that the stressful events they've experienced, particularly in childhood, uh, can really impact them physically today. So that's me in a nutshell, I guess. Incredible. And how empowering is it to know, oh, Harry's joining us, <laughs> um, to know that our bodies aren't broken and that we can actually use this, use the traumas that we've had in our past and understanding these traumas and releasing these traumas 
to to heal and to really um live our lives in the way that we want to because I know for example with pain it can hold a lot of people back you know when you become injured um you know and you're an athlete that is a huge not only physical barrier but a but a psychological barrier so it's very very empowering when we when we know this and we can kind of move past it so um how do, do these traumas kind of become stored in our bodies like what why why does this happen you know yeah yeah sure so i guess the first part of that is is understanding that it's not you that's broken it's the healthcare system mm-hmm. so the healthcare system the traditional healthcare system and, and don't get me wrong like i'm not bad mouthing the healthcare system if i'm ever in a in an accident or i'm Stop critically ill that's that's, that's, the, that's the first place that i'm going to be going right but when it comes to a lot of chronic conditions when it comes to conditions that don't get better under that traditional form of healthcare Mm-hmm. Well, that can often leave people to believe that there's something wrong with them. It's like, if these doctors can't fix me, well, then there must be something wrong with me. And that's just nonsense because think about it. I, I think about this all the time is you think about plants and you think about mother nature. And it's like, do you honestly think that mother nature, like think, have you ever thought about how amazing the human body is? Like the way that we digest our food and blink and breathe and pump blood through our body and um, exchange nutrients. Like it is such a complex incredible system when you actually look at some of the details of it that it's kind of ignorant to believe that that mother nature is somehow making mistakes that she somehow um made us faulty or weak in some capacity i i just don't believe that at all i think that the human body is is incredible and and if you look at nature nature's never broken it's just that nature is often adapting for things in their in their environment so plants are a great example plants aren't inherently diseased but they will express disease when they are adapting for certain changes in their environment. And when you can start to look at the human body the same way, you can start to recognize that you're not broken, that your body's actually working for you, not against you. So often the reason that people believe that they are broken is because they just haven't dealt with, they haven't found the right cause of whatever symptom that they're dealing with. And if you're going down the traditional route of, of looking for answers, chances are a lot of the, um, practitioners that you work with won't be looking at emotional stress and won't be looking at trauma simply because they're not trained in it. Most like I never, I don't think I had a single lesson in my five year chiropractic degree about how emotional trauma impacts the body. It's just not taught. And so as a result, practitioners don't have the tools to actually deal with it. So going back to your question, it's like you said, how do these traumas get stored in the body? And I have a, I, if anyone's heard any of my stuff before, I've probably told this story a thousand times because it's just such a really great example and helps to really understand how these things works. And I imagine Lizzie being chased by a lion, right? Or you're in California. So, or maybe like a bear for perhaps. So you have bears there, right? Yeah, we have bears. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. I know it's for me coming from England. (laughs) Just like the scariest thing in England is maybe a badger. (laughs) <laughs> yeah right. well bears are like the only thing that we don't have in australia that can kill you i think we can everything else in australia it basically kills you so but imagine for a moment being chased by a bear now being chased by that bear is a stressful event it's something that you couldn't be prepared for and as such your body will immediately oops, immediately kick into gear right your blood pressure will shoot through the roof your pupil, your vision will, will become really narrowed and focused. Your blood supply will shift away from the digestive organs. Your digestion will slow and you, the blood will be redirected to your limbs so that you can escape. Mm-hmm. Your breathing will change. Your, your, your breath rate will go through the roof. So these symptoms, you can kind of see that there's nothing wrong with those symptoms. What do you think those symptoms are there for? What are they doing for you? They're adaptive, right? they're going to help us survive. Exactly. They're going to help us survive. So this is the thing. It's like you can understand that an increased blood pressure, for example, is going to help you to survive in that instance. Now, the thing with nature is normally if you're being chased by a bear, it's, there's only one of two results. You escape or you get killed. So in the event that you escape, those physical changes no longer are required. So what do you think is going to happen to your blood pressure a couple hours after you stop getting chased by the bear? 
it's going to go down again, go back yeah. to normal. Because you, your, your, your um, body doesn't need to help you adapt and survive. So this is a really simple example. And it's a really um, basic example. But what we start to see is that what people don't address is if let's just use blood pressure as an example. If someone had excessively high blood pressure, they're not often, they're looking at that and going, that's a bad thing, but what's the blood pressure adapting for? Why is that blood pressure there in the first place? And so when you can start to understand that the body, and this is the beautiful thing about the human body is it's constantly adapting for the stressful events that we've experienced in our life. Right. And, but you might say, well, Hey, I'm not actually that stressed. I don't know why I'm in pain, or I don't know why I've got fibromyalgia, or I don't know why this back pain flares up three times a year. I'm not actually that stressed. And to that, what I would say is we have this beautiful thing in our brain called the prefrontal cortex, which is um, what sets us apart from other mammals. And basically we have the ability to ruminate. We have the ability to project into the future and remember the past. And so, so often people that are in pain or people that have some kind of chronic physical symptom like digestive issues or skin conditions, whatever it might be, aren't necessarily going through a stressful event in the moment. But let's say you were chased by a bear three years ago. Unconsciously, you will be reminded of that in various ways. Maybe you visit the same national park that you're at regularly, and that's where you got chased by a bear. And all of a sudden, bang, your symptoms will come back. Every time you see a bear on television, bang, your symptoms will return as, as your body thinks it needs to adapt again. Or every time that you smell uh, some kind of animal that smells kind of like a bear, maybe your cat smells like a bear bang this is going to then remind you again subconsciously and flare those adaptations back up create those adaptations again because your body goes the last time i smelt this the last time that i saw that the last time that i was here the last time i spoke to that person the stressful event occurred and so our body is often unconsciously adapting to reminders of stressful events that we've been through in the past if that makes sense yes absolutely so i know that a lot of people go, okay, so I'm not being chased by a bear or a lion or any kind of threatening animal um, at at the moment, unless we're kind of, you know, out on safari. Um, So my stressful event in, 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 in a kind of daily situation, that can still kind of cause those effects. So for example, a lot of my clients come to me and um, they have um, limiting beliefs about not being good enough. Um, they are perfectionists. They, um, you know, seek external validation, that kind of thing. Can that, can those be traumas that are stored in the body? Just like if you were being chased by a lion or a bear. Absolutely. And, this is often the root of all physical pain, uh, often the root of all fatigue, things like chronic fatigue, um, certain like Epstein-Barr virus symptoms, for example. So the, the whole I'm not good enough is something that is that people often experience as a child. And one of the things that I've seen is it often comes from the relationship with your early caregivers, particularly your mum. And if you have a situation as a child where your mum's going through some stuff, maybe she's going through a divorce or maybe she's um, had a, a stillborn or a miscarriage and she's dealing with her own form of trauma, what that can often do is it takes away from you as a child. It's like, I, I'm not getting the emotional nurturing that I need as a little baby. And so what we immediately start to do is we start going into, I need to perform or do something in order to, get mum's attention in order to feel safe again. And so what this does is it sets us up for a lifetime of feeling like we need to perform or we need to be good enough in order to feel safe. And so as a result, uh, so many adults are continuing to run this pattern of being perfectionists, of procrastinating, of never feeling like they're doing enough. And I'm not necessarily, this doesn't necessarily just stem from the relationship with your mum. You might've had a really critical parent. You might've been bullied at school. But somewhere along the way, if you formulated the belief that I'm not enough, I'm not good enough, this is going to cause your body to adapt. Now, specifically in nature, the, we, as human beings, we are animals. We kind of forget this from time to time, but we are just very comfortable. We're just, we're just animals, right? So in nature, if an animal feels like it's not enough, if it feels like it's not good enough, 
biologically that equates to being physically weak. Okay. So two deer and they're fighting. One of them loses that fight. They feel like they're not good enough. As a result, it's usually because they're physically weaker. So the cool thing that your body does, right, is um, when you feel not enough, when you feel useless, when you feel like you're you're not good or you're not worthy or whatever it might be, your body's going to physically adapt and break down muscle tissue make and break down um, joints and bones and this kind of stuff. And the reason it does that is so that when it rebuilds, you're physically stronger. And so if you're physically stronger, it means that you no longer have to devalue yourself. You don't have to put yourself down. You can finally feel good enough. So in nature, being stronger equates to being good enough. And so what's happening is all the people, and this was my thing, unconsciously, I had the belief that I wasn't enough. I wasn't good enough. I was useless. I was worthless. And this was driving my behavior to push, 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 perfectionism, all this kind of stuff. And as a, result, as a result, this is why I was experiencing so much pain because I didn't feel good enough. My body goes, okay, cool. Let's make you stronger. And so you get all these adaptations in the muscles, the bones and the joints that cause physical pain. And so this is where we see that actually stem from. I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's people watching this and going, oh, mind blown, because that's so relatable. I feel like there's so many of us who have had those types of experiences and can probably start to relate to, oh, this physical symptom could, that's been bugging me for years could be a result of that. So mm. when I first came across your work, I started to consider the fact that when I was 22, I got diagnosed with osteoporosis in my lower back. And mm. I got told that um, as a result, you know, I would have weak bones and it wasn't something that you could reverse. Um, and that felt very disempowering for me um, as a 22 year old being diagnosed with a 60 year old woman's disease. Um, and so I started working out in the gym to try and build my bone strength. And as a result, I felt stronger. And when I went for my last bone scan, my osteoporosis had actually improved to osteopenia. So it's a, a lesser version of um, of bone density um, degradation. And so that was kind of my aha of, oh, my body can heal itself and I am getting stronger. And the strength was coming from the physical strength, but also I was physically valuing myself more because I felt stronger. And yes. my guess is that ever sort of since that bone scan, I've worked on myself worth even more. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, how that has improved. So even if you have a chronic disease that, you know, the medical system says, oh, you can't heal that. Yes, you can. <laughs> it's maybe time to, to, to think outside the box and look at some of the emotional traumas that you are potentially storing. Where are you devaluing yourself? Where has that devaluation happened in the past? Um, and, and kind of move, move forward. Now, for those people who are starting to think, oh, this is starting to make sense, but I don't know in the past where that trauma has happened. Like I can't recall a specific event or something where I've not felt good enough. Um, what, would you, what would you say to, to that person? How can they start to identify the trauma so they can move past it and, and heal? Beautiful question. Yeah, so I'll just go back to your first point is when you go through a, devalu a self-devaluation, so um, let's, say at, let's say you had a bad breakup at, um, I don't know, let's say your first love at 16, you, you had a really bad breakup. And because of that, you felt like you weren't good enough. And that set you up for experiencing the self-devaluation. So when you're devaluing yourself, it's like doing a workout at the gym. When you're doing a workout at the gym, it causes muscles to inherently get a little bit weaker so that they can, they just get weaker due to the stress. And so it's the same thing. It's when you're going through a stressful period, muscle fibers and actually bone as well will become, will start to break down and become less strong. And 
during that time, you typically don't notice any symptoms. But once you then start to resolve the self-devaluation, that's when the muscles and the bones actually start to get stronger and repair, much like how you get sore after going to the gym. It's once those muscle fibers have torn, once you finish the workout, that's when they actually start to repair. So um, this is the same reason why often people get sick when they go on holidays or sick after a stressful period. But what typically happens is, the stressful period causes this, this adaptation, things to get weaker. And then when that re resolves, that's when you get the healing and that's when you, things start to regenerate. And on that, one of the things that I would say is one of my favorite sayings when I was in practice was uh, treat the man, not the scan, treat the person, not the scan. But what that means is so often people are, are just pigeonholed into their lab findings or into their bone scan results or into their ultrasounds. And one of the things is it's, Looking at that, it can be quite disempowering, as you said, but when you can recognize that stress and emotional trauma impacts the physical body, well, that's when it becomes more empowering because now instead of being a victim to your body, now you actually have the ability to do something about it, which is really cool. So going back to your question, your question was, well, how do like people go all the time, people come to me all the time, they go, but Jake, I've been through a heap of stuff in my life. Like I've been through all kinds of stressful events and Naturally, that's the case, especially if you're a human being, because that's the nature of being human. So how do you identify what, what uh, traumas or stressful events that you've experienced? What are causing your symptoms? And this is where things get really cool, because um, firstly, these, these patterns are going to be unconscious. If you're aware of them, you wouldn't be having the problem, right? If you're aware that you have an inner mean girl, as you say, or if you're aware that you're devaluing yourself, you can stop it. But if most people aren't even aware... So this is where um, Germany medicine becomes really cool because we use your symptoms as a guide to what's going on between your ears, what's, what stressful events that you've experienced. So if you're dealing with back pain, for example, that's going to pertain to a specific type of self-evaluation. If you're dealing with shoulder pain, that's another one. If you're dealing with neck pain, that's another one. If you're dealing with fibromyalgia, that's a different type of conflict. And so based on that, you can start to identify like back pain, for example, is a support conflict, feeling like you're not getting enough support, feeling like uh, you can't support someone else. And so then when you go, all right, Lizzie, so where is it that you feel like you didn't feel supported around this particular time when this symptom started, you can start to draw the dots. You can start to understand exactly what's causing the symptoms. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. It, St Tracy and Steve, welcome, by the way. Um, if you have any questions, please type it in the chat. Um, this is, this is getting really juicy. So yeah, that makes perfect sense. So what you're saying is just to clarify, if I'm having pain in my shoulder, that can, it has a specific cause from mm -hmm. an emotional standpoint compared to um, pain in my left foot, that's a completely different emotional cause. And German Correct. new medicine can kind of like point us towards what that emotional cause could be based on your symptom. Exactly. And that's how you can get laser focused. You, instead of in, like most people, when they start learning about how emotional trauma and stress impact the body, they want to fix everything. It's like, I need to go back and repair everything that I've ever been through, which is a bit of a recipe for disaster. Whereas when you can start to understand Germany medicine, you can start to use your body as, as the guide to direct you to what specific events and traumas that you need to deal with. So shoulder, for example, is a relationship self-devaluation, feeling like you've let someone down, feeling guilty in a sense. Neck pain is an intellectual self-devaluation, feeling like you're an idiot, feeling like you're dumb, feeling like you're, you've made a mistake in some capacity. Often this can be triggered from being criticized. Um, knee pain, for example, is a physical performance conflict. You see this a lot with athletes feeling like they're not fast enough, feeling like they're not strong enough to be able to keep up anymore. The knee will actually start to undergo this change to make you stronger. Like, so all of these different areas of the body pertain to different types of self-devaluation. All pain stems from a self-devaluation. It's trying to make you stronger, but where on the body it shows up, is in what joints, what muscles are affected is going to determine what we call the flavor, what, what flavor of self-devaluation. Um, and then another thing is often people will say, oh, I only get pain always on my right-hand side or it's all my pains all on my left-hand side. And to that, I'd say it's not that you're out of balance or you're leaning over to your left or, or you might be, but um, one of the things is 
if you clap your hands for me, Lizzie, like if you just clap your hands, so just, so if you clap your hands, which hand would go on top? My right. Okay, so just do that for me. So just clap for me and then, and then do the left hand on top. So which one of those feels more natural to you? I can already tell. The right. Yeah. <laughs> so, you're, so this is a great test that people can do at home is if you clap your hands, when you clap with one hand on top of the other, one way will feel very natural. The other way will feel kind of a bit clunky, a bit awkward. So the hand that goes on top that feels more comfortable is what we call your um, biological handedness. So for you, Lizzie, you're right-handed. So any pain that shows up on the right-hand side of your body is going to be related to partner, okay? So partner is like your first partner is typically your father. Uh, siblings are also typically partner and romantic partners. Now, this can be both male and female. It's not masculine, feminine. Part, partner, people assume means male. It's not at all. It could be like your best girlfriends might show up on the right side as partner if you have a conflict with them. Whereas the left-hand side of your body is going to relate to mother and child. So conflicts pertaining to your mum, your children, your cat, for example, would be a child. Mm -hmm. uh, potentially your business might be a child. So that's how we can start to see. So if you've got pain on the left side of your shoulder, this would be a conflict that tells me this is something where Lizzie feels like potentially she's let her mum down or she's let her children down. Mm -hmm. So then we can get even more laser focused instead of going, it's not just a relationship self-devaluation where you felt like you've hurt someone or let someone down, but it's a relationship self-devaluation pertaining to your mum or your children. So we can get really precise with this stuff, which, and then when you say that to someone, it's like, where do you feel like you've let your mum down in the last six months? You go, oh my goodness, I forgot her birthday and she was really upset, like this kind of thing. And then additionally, if, you, if the left hand is listening, if your left hand is more comfortable on top, the opposite is true. So your, the left side of your body pertains to partner and the right side pertains to mother and children. Wow. What a powerful tool. Like, yeah. it's, it's, it's so powerful, but also beautifully simple. Like, so simple. And once you kind of have that understanding, you can really drill down, right? So in terms so we we're talking in terms of pain but can you also use this concept in terms of things like weight gain digestive issues um some of my clients suffer from things like hypothyroidism can you kind of speak kind of have that same language in other physical symptoms so Dr. Harmer is um the guy who discovered the five biological laws in Germany medicine and how he discovered it was through, he actually got testicular assist on his testicle. And basically he was working at the, um, the University of Munich as uh, the head of internal medicine. And he was, I can't remember how old he was at the time, but his son Dirk Harmer was unexpectedly shot and killed uh, while he was on holiday. And obviously for a father, that's a horrifically stressful event. And a few months after the passing of his son, he started to develop this cyst on his testicle. And he goes, oh, that's really interesting. Like I'm pretty healthy. I'm, I'm relatively fit. I eat well. I wonder if the loss of my son has anything to do with my, the growth on my testicle. And anyway, so working in a hospital, he was then able to interview all the other men in the hospital who had testicular cancer. He's like, he kind of did what no medical doctor had ever done before. Instead of just looking at their scans and the lab reports and all that kind of stuff, he actually talked to them and he said, <laughs> Hey, what's maybe in a bit more of an Austrian accent, but he, he said, Hey, like what's been going on? Have you experienced any kind of stressful events? And sure enough, what he discovered is all the men who had experienced testicular cancer and testicular lumps and cysts uh, had been through some kind of loss conflict. Maybe they'd lost a child, maybe they'd lost a wife or a friend or a colleague or a pet. And so this is where Dr. Harmer started to piece this stuff together. And so from there, he was able to map out the entire body. He was able to look at all kinds of physical conditions and determine what kind of stressful event caused them. Wow. Going back to the testicle, what he discovered is that having this cyst on his testicle essentially gave him more testicle, which was meant he was able to produce more testosterone and more sperm cells, which why would a man who's just lost his son biologically need more sperm and more testosterone? Because, right. you know, that's 
right? As a as a man, that's how you pass on your your genetics. You have children. Yeah. So you've lost so, a child. Yeah. yeah, the loss of the child, his body goes, all right, well, I'm going to help you adapt so that you can replace that lost child. Mm -hmm. Think of it from a real biological perspective. So all kinds of conditions have been studied and documented um, through Dr. Hunt's findings. So we, you can pretty much name anything and we can dive into it a bit more like any kind of common conditions. I'd be more than happy to sort of chat to, but yes, yeah, skin conditions, digestive issues, thyroid issues, weight gain, adrenal fatigue, liver issues, like the list goes on. You can literally, if it's, if it's some kind of chronic illness that you're dealing with that you haven't, that no one can seem to figure out, there is known causes uh, in terms of emotional stress and trauma that cause your body to adapt in that way. So is there anything in particular that you'd like to discuss? Uh, I'm going to turn it over to my lovely participants here. So uh, Tracy, Steve, do you have anything? There we go. Uh, hi, Jake. But my life hey, hey, an athlete, much like you, throughout my hip uh, in high school, playing soccer and went through chiropractic and recovered. But now, many years later, I still deal with pain in that area on and off. What would the lower back slash hip pain correspond with? Yeah, so I threw my hip out playing soccer in high school. So often what happens here is, as I said before, when you're going through some kind of emotionally distressing event, the muscles and the tissues around the affected part of the body will actually get weaker. And so often what happens is if that tissue is weaker and you're going about playing soccer, for example, you're far more susceptible to actually throwing it out or injuring it. So um, I had the same experience. It's, it's um, understanding that. So helping you to understand exactly what triggered that is really important. So the first question that I would have is looking at um, looking at your hand and it's like I talked about before, is your right hand more comfortable on top? Is your left hand more comfortable on top? Now, if you can answer this, okay, Steve's, Steve's on the chat, sweet. And so which hip does it pertain to? Is it your right hip or is it your left hip? And when you say hip, where do you mean? Do you mean in the front of your hip and your groin or do you mean like in your lower back? Is this easier? That's easier. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, I'm right-handed and it's generally in the lower right-hand side of my low back so my hip was actually out of the joint when i went to the chiropractor one ball joint went up and one went down i played on it like that for about a month or five weeks before i figured out what it was hang on so you dislocated your hip and you're there's i <clears throat> doubt that you're playing on a dislocated hip what essentially do you mean is what they told me when i went in he had me kind of you know put your hands against the wall lift the leg and ball joint on one side went one way and the other side went the other way okay um, so when you, if you can stand up, point to the pain where you get it, that would be much easier if, if we can yeah, have it. It's uh, generally right through here. So. Okay, cool. Can you feel it right now, Steve? Like if you bend backwards or something, can you make the pain kind of flare up a little bit? No, I mean, day to day, it's, it's generally fine. It, it, yeah. Longer car rides, certain days sitting or laying in bed for more than, you know, seven or eight hours of sleep, it'll usually wake up tight or sore or yep. that type of thing and then it'll just randomly pop in yeah okay so this is um so for you you're right-handed it's on your right hand side so this conflict is going to pertain not to mother or child but to partner so partner is basically anyone who's not your mom or your kids okay so and that particular area is i'd classify as lower back lower back so hip hip stuff is more when people have hip pain, it's usually like really in the front of their hip, like in their, almost in their groin region. So that would be what we call a lower back conflict, which is a support conflict. So how we'd go about this, if I was working with you one-to-one -one, is I'd be going, okay, so you, you threw your hip out when you were in high school. So what age was that specifically? Probably 17. Yeah. Okay, cool. So 17. So what this tells me is that you're likely you likely experienced some kind of conflict around that time that you were 17, probably a little bit before, which caused the tissues to actually weaken, making you more susceptible to injury. Because I'm assuming like being a fit guy, it's like people don't just 17 year olds don't just throw hips out typically. <laughs> right. So what I'd be looking at there is going, 
around that time, around 17, around 16, where was it that you experienced an unexpected and emotionally distressing event where you felt as though you weren't getting supported, you weren't being looked after or cared for? Okay. Um, I mean, it's, it's high school at that point. So there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of that, but yeah, I'd have to dig in on that a little bit. Yeah. So we, we don't need to go into it right now. Like you don't need to dive into your psyche and your soul right here on this call, but that's where I'd be looking is I'd be going, what happened around that time? So for me, say I had, I had a really similar thing. I fractured my back in a few places playing AFL and naturally like if you threw your hip out like that it should take a couple months and you'd be back on your feet if it's purely a physical thing uh, i had the same thing i had fractures in my spine um, at 16 and what i figured out it was mine was also to do with partner mine was to do with like the first girl i ever fell madly and deeply in love with basically left me for another guy and so i felt unsupported um by, by that and that's what triggered all this change it wasn't until i was like 27 that i figured that out and that's when i finally was able to get rid of that pain so i'd be digging around there and going where was it that you felt unsupported by a partner it might be uh, uh, like a romantic partner it might be a friend it might be you know, your father or siblings but essentially these conflicts and the conflicts that, that manifest physically are the things that we feel like we have to keep to ourselves the things that we feel like we can't talk to other people about. Like I, I, I felt silly talking about, about that situation with my friends or with my family. I felt like, Oh, I just need to get over it. These are the things when we, when, when we internalize things, these are what are typically the conflicts that manifest physically. Now on top of that, Steve. So once you identify what that event is, then you've got to start to understand that your body's actually working for you because so often what happens is, when you go to a physio or a chiro or a doctor and they take scans, they put the scans up and they go, oh, look here, this is the problem. This is why you have this pain, which is what we're trained to do, right? But what that does is it sets you up for a lifetime of a belief that there is something wrong with my hip. There is something wrong with my uh, back, with my body, because I saw it on a scan, okay? Now, what then happens, you have the belief that there's my body is broken, my body is weak, what do you think your brain is? What What do you think your brain's going to do with that thought that my body is weak? What's it going to try and do? Make it stronger. It's going to try and make it stronger. And you're a fit guy going to the gym in order to make a muscle stronger. What do you first need to do? Break it down. Break it down. So what happens is when you have this belief that there is something wrong with my body or my body is broken, my hip is screwed, whatever languaging that you use, your brain hears that and goes, okay, Steve, let's make it stronger for you. But first I've got to break it down. I've got to break down that tissue so that you can rebuild it stronger. So this is a pattern that a lot of people get caught into, particularly when they've been pain, have been in pain for as long as you have, is there's all of these unconscious beliefs that I'm somehow broken or that I'm weak or that I'm, uh, my body is injured. So when you're able to really identify what that root cause was what the first trigger or the stressful event was once you can do that and start to process through that you actually start to feel a bit better and then once you feel better it, it, it tells you and it gives you this confirmation that you're not broken you're not screwed that your body is actually working for you not against you so that would be where i would start with, with that is is it's going to be related to partner it's going to be likely a support conflict so feeling like you're not getting support my example is a great example or potentially the other way around, feeling as though you couldn't support or look after someone. So made up example, imagine your father was unwell and you felt like you couldn't look after him. You couldn't do enough for him to, to help him. Identify what that is and then understand where you're still unconsciously holding onto that, remembering that, dealing with that. That's going to go a really long way. I hope that helps. Awesome, thank you. What will happen is either you've thought of something while we've been talking and you haven't mentioned it and you don't have to mention it, but what will often happen is once we've started talking about this and you've started going, oh, it's a support conflict that's related to a partner, what will often happen is later in the day or the evening when you're not thinking about it, when you're driving or having a shower, something will pop into your brain. When that happens, don't ignore it. That'll be, that'll be an important factor for you, okay? Cool. Thank you. Awesome, mate. But yeah, you can heal. Your body can heal. I've seen it so many times. So many people with like 30 plus years of pain, 30 
50, I, one lady was like 60 years of pain and she was able to identify this and move through it. So yeah, don't give up hope. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh my goodness. Imagine after 60 years of pain being able to, yeah. you know, heal from yeah. that. That's incredible. So as you were talking, what kind of became apparent to me is that there are some clients who struggle with losing weight you know they come to me and say you know Lizzie I just want to feel better in my body and we do get them to feel better in their body but sometimes the weight loss is very um slow yeah and what came to mind was well you know that could be another form of the self-devaluation and some of the stories that we're telling ourselves about well we're not that type of person or we are this type of person we are the fat kid in the playground or we're you know um so we're just big boned or whatever it is um so for my clients who maybe find weight loss difficult is that something that maybe you could kind of speak into for oh yeah absolutely so self-devaluations pertain purely to musculoskeletal pain typically Okay, so with weight loss, and yes, there is self-devaluations that occur because of being overweight or because I'm big boned or, or whatever the beliefs that are there, but weight gain specifically is a different conflict. It's known as an, as an abandonment conflict, an isolation, uh, an existence conflict, or a refugee conflict. So if you think about it, when people put on weight, what are they actually storing more of? Fat or water, do you think? Uh, well, it's a combination because they're yeah. getting ready to, you know, throw a, throw a famine. Yeah. So often it, it's what, what we actually see is water gets stored and often that gets stored in fat cells. So what happens is when it, an individual experiences an unexpected isolation, so maybe um, being forced to, like you could have experienced, you, you, you haven't, but you could have experienced a, a an abandonment conflict by moving to the States, for example, and not being able to go back and see your pack or your family. Um, So that could trigger an isolation conflict. It could trigger an abandonment conflict. It could trigger a refugee conflict. If you move to the States and just felt like a complete fish out of water, it felt like you didn't belong. You didn't know where you, where your place was. You didn't know where your pack was. What your body does in that exam, in that instance is it stores fluid. It stores water. Your kidneys will actually adapt. So weight gain is actually a kidney uh, program. And so your kidneys will adapt and conserve fluid. It will conserve water because it's, it's like being thrust into the desert. It's like if you feel abandoned, if you feel isolated, it's like being in the desert. Your brain goes, all right, we need to conserve all of the water that we can in order to survive because water is used in pretty much every metabolic process within the body. As a result, it's like we need to conserve it. So Clients that are dealing with uh, weight gain aren't dealing with weight gain. They're dealing with isolations or abandonments. The other one there is existence conflict. So often this is triggered by an unexpected visit to the hospital. So feeling as though my life is at stake. So going in for like, maybe you had uh, appendicitis and you had to go in for an emergency procedure and you felt as though your life might be at stake. Like this can trigger that weight gain. Like this can trigger that, um, it can trigger the, the conservation of water. So less of, less of a self-evaluation, although the self-evaluation is uh, secondary, I guess, you're looking more at abandonment and isolation. Interesting. And that's really, really interesting because I was reading about this the other week. Um, I was wondering what, because when I moved to the States, I noticed that I got more, um, more bags under my eyes, kind of like a bit more puffiness. And that's another abandonment thing. That's a, that's a kidney um, mm kidney Correct. issue I don't like the word issue but it's related to the kidneys um Correct. so that when you when you were talking about that I was like yeah I didn't gain weight but I got puffy under eyes COVID kilos like this is a perfect example of like so many people through the pandemic put on weight they put on they call them COVID kilos here in Australia and the reason being is so many people felt incredibly isolated uh, incredibly abandoned and as a result their kidneys are going all right let's conserve as much fluid as we can so people not being able to see their families people being stuck in their homes people not being able to travel to go to the uk and get married like these kinds of things so we we see we see we've seen that a lot in the last uh, the last two years wow 
But uh, that's so interesting. So final question. This is a little bit woo for my woos out there. Um, so I, as a baby, I was three months old. I Very experienced nice. a intersusception, which is where essentially your um, small intestine telescopes in on itself. And I had to yeah. have life changing, well, life saving surgery um, because I was coughing up blood and you know, very, very ill. So my question is, as a baby, you know, um, three months, it's very difficult to kind of get trauma and then that trauma be manifested into something like that. So I, this is, this is a very out there question. <laughs> Can you carry in from things like past lives, karmic things, can that come in to current life and cause some of these really chronic, serious conditions? Yeah, simple answer. I'll, I'll explain the woo with a bit of science if that's all right. Okay. So yes, please. <laughs> first, and, first and foremost, not everything pertains to some kind of emotional trauma. Like some, some conditions are purely physical. So mm -hmm. that's an example that might be purely physical. Uh, if I got hit by a bus and broke my leg, like there's no emotional trauma there. There's emotional trauma that comes after that. There's emotional trauma that would have come for you as a baby being separated from mum and having to go through surgery. Like that's a stressful event. But what's triggering that is potentially something structural, potentially something physical, okay? So, but what about th when things aren't structural? What about when things aren't physical? Well, what we know through epigenetics is that trauma can actually be inherited. So I'll give you, I'll tell you about a study. So um, it's called, the, I think it's called like, um, it's called the cherry blossom study or mm -hmm. kind of affectionately known as, but what they did, this is phenomenal. When I heard this, this kind of broke my brain. They got mice, uh, male mice in particular, and they expose them to the smell of cherry blossoms, the, the, the flower, right? Every time these, these mice were exposed to the scent of cherry blossoms, they'd get electrocuted. Scent, electrocute. Scent, electrocute. Scent, electrocute. Now, what we saw is they had epigenetic changes in, the, in their uh, amygdala, their fear, their, their fear um, area of the brain part of the limbic system and they also had epigenetic, epigenetic changes in their nasal sinuses better be at, so to be able to better smell when that smell was coming so what do you think happened to those mice when you then expose them to the cherry blossom sent down the road like what do you how do you think they'd feel they're gonna have fear oh they're gonna be petrified there's gonna be this this immediate conditioned fear response so that makes sense right it's like if if that was a human that would make sense what they did is they got these traumatized mice and they mated them with untraumatized uh mice so the untraumatized mice in this example had never smelt cherry blossoms never been electrocuted these these two mice then bred and they had offspring the offspring what do you think happened when they smelt cherry blossoms even though they'd, they'd never been shocked, they'd never been electrocuted, what happened when they smelled cherry blossoms? They, they felt fear. They, yeah, had the aversion. They freaked out, right? But where things get even more interesting is they, they never shocked the, the children of these mice, but then they bred them with unaffected or untraumatized mice again. And the third generation, when they were exposed to cherry blossoms, freaked out so what happened is is that epigenetic change and the conditioned fear response that was experienced in this instance by uh, a grandparent my mouse was being expressed epigenetically in the third generation down so what often happens and if you want to read more about this uh, mark woolen it didn't start with you brilliant book but um if you want to if understanding how this plays out into our own lives is so many of the people that I work with come to me and they go, I just feel anxious. I just feel stressed. I just feel X, Y, Z, and I don't understand why. And so often if, and they, what they'll often say is Jake, I haven't been through any major trauma. Like my childhood was great. This was good, blah, blah, blah. But what is often the case is they're expressing a fear response to something that isn't theirs. And this has been this that study has actually been replicated in humans. We've seen that it was actually done in Sydney, Australia. We actually they didn't electrocute men and, <laughs> and breathe them, but, but they saw the same <laughs> they saw the same epigenetic markers in the sperm, so they they could recognise that this was being um, transferred from one generation to the next. So, if this is the case, it's like if you don't have 
if you haven't necessarily been through any major trauma, but you still feel, I'm going to use the word traumatized, if you still feel on edge all the time, chances are it could be an epigenic response from either your parents or your grandparents, which is, I think, wild. And opening up opening up people to this is huge. Like so much of the stress that you see and experience is often coming from someone in your lineage and so um this is this is really cool and and one of the things that's that's really important with that is like holocaust survivors mm. when the, the trauma that gets passed on through generations isn't spoken about and it isn't it isn't dealt with so holocaust survivors went through some of the world's worst atrocities in history they, there was no possible way that they could have processed that trauma. They, they just didn't have the abilities or, or the space to do so. They would have just been living in a constant state of fear and stress for the rest of their lives. But then the third generation down, all of a sudden their life is starting to be a bit more spacious. It's a bit more carefree. It's a bit easier. The, the stressful events aren't really as intense. As a result, this is when those, those traumas actually start to be expressed because now the grandchild, for example, has the space to actually deal with what the grandparents or the parents couldn't deal with. So I hope that answers your question. That really does. That's so interesting. It's so, you know, when we had that opening of, all right, now it's time to, now it's time to break things down so that we can heal. That's when things get expressed. Um, yeah. And so when you can recognize that, oh, I'm carrying something of my mother, or I'm carrying a fear of my grandmother or my grandfather, you can almost give it back to them and go, oh, I don't have to worry about this. Or you can process it. You can do whatever you want to do with that. But um, that's really empowering to actually understand why you're getting unconsciously triggered or stressed or anxious to stimuluses that are otherwise safe. Yeah. I, and, you know, you can sort of give that back with love and compassion and say, you know, it's your fault. It's not, it's no one's fault. They were in the situation that they were in, but you can say, okay, well, that's not mine to, you know, carry. So I can yeah. also give that back to you. So. And you're not burdening the parent by giving it back. It's or the grandparent. It's just about freeing yourself from that. So I'll give you some con a contextual example. I, would, I used to get really scared when other people were driving. Like I, I would be a bit of a control freak. I'd be like, I, I don't like being a passenger in other people's cars. Completely fine now. But I was going, why am I so stressed about being a passenger in a, in a car? Like my mates are good drivers. The people that I'm with are safe and drivers have never had an accident. Why am I so, like I would get stressed. I'd be sweaty driving with someone else. And then what I realized is once I started learning this work, I go, all right, who else felt the same way? And I was like, oh my goodness. My mom, when she was about 16, was in a, a fatal car accident. She was one of the, I think she was the only person to survive. She lost like three of her friends um, in an accident, which was horrific, right? And I recognized in that moment that I was actually experiencing the same stress that she would have felt. And I realized that it wasn't my stress. It wasn't... Um, my condition response it was actually something that had epigenetically been been passed down to me so learning that was really empowering because i could start to go okay every time i'd get in the car and i'd start feeling stressed I'd be like it's okay i'm safe it's not mine and acknowledging what my mum went through is also a really big part of helping me to release that so that lizzie you and i could go for a drive now and i, I wouldn't be getting too sweaty yeah, well you probably would because i don't have my driving license i'm just gonna say that probably don't want to get in a car with me just yet but yes i know i know what you mean and that like everything that you've discussed just feels so empowering mm -hmm. and i feel like i'm i hark on about the diet industry and how it is very disempowering but you probably feel the same way about the medical industry in you know in general and what i think is great about what you do is that you are giving back people's power you're giving them the tools so that they can heal um even if other things haven't worked traditionally so thank you for that um yeah, it's, and... it's, a, it's the reason why i do this stuff is because when i was younger i didn't realize i i gave away all of my power to people in white coats because i thought that they knew more than me and i thought that there was no way that i could heal there was no way i could do this myself but when you have an actual simple framework to understand how your body works and how your body adapts all of a sudden you do have the ability to start overcoming some of these chronic conditions that 
haven't shifted. So it's, it is it is a much more empowering way to live. And it's, it's a lot less fearful because you don't have to worry about your body. It's like people might call me um, ignorant and negligent, but it's like, I, I would say like, if I'm dealing with some kind of like pain or I don't panic, like I'm just like, oh, I must've gone through a conflict. Let's figure out what it is and let it go. Instead of panicking and working myself up, which only creates more problems and more adaptations in the body, you can actually end that like fear panic spiral that often occurs, which actually is a much more conducive place to helping your body heal as well. Yeah, and it just have ripple effects as well. So it's going to help you with your sleep, which is also going to help you heal. It's going to help you just, you know, have more inner peace, as you say, which is also going to help you heal. So it's it's, it's such a domino effect. So it's, it's incredible. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I really want to honor your time. Um, so I think I'm going to finish it now. But before I do, where can people keep in contact with you? Where can they reach out and find out more? Um, because I'm going to be reading more into this. So <laughs> I know other people will, will want to too. Yeah, sure. Um, so the best place to reach me is probably Instagram. Uh, my Instagram thing is Jake underscore Curry, C double R I E. Um, so if you have any questions or if you have any um, comments or what your biggest takeaways were after this listening, I'd love to hear it. Um, if you want to learn more about this work, I actually have a program teaching you how to eliminate pain yourself, understanding the process to, to move through that. And you can check that out at thepaineliminator.com. I have a free training there, which goes into more detail about how this stuff all works, how you identify things and how you can start to hear yourself. And then we also have a program for um, people that want to get out of pain, which is called the pain eliminator, which um, if you want to know more about that, just message me and I can send you the details. Um, additionally, if you're a practitioner, if you're a, a naturopath or if you're a chiro or an osteo or you work with clients, I actually teach practitioners how to implement this work with their own people as well. So all of those ways, I'm happy to be here and be of service and help you. But um, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. That's incredible. Thank you so much. And Tracy says, thanks, Jake. This is, is no this worries, guys. interesting. So um, I'll, when I repost and share this recording, I'll also share the, the links that you have just mentioned. So Perfect. Um, just want to say thank you so much again for your time. I really appreciate you. And I think what you're doing is absolutely fantastic. So thank you, Lizzie. Right back at you. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Have a great evening or day, I should say, yeah. <laughs> in Australia. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Lizzie. <laughs>